Hey guys, welcome to my questions and answers for HOCD. Okay, just to let you know that this shouldn't really replace therapy. A bit of a cliche to say, but it's true. And um, what I'm going to do today, I originally intended, intended to do like 51 questions, whatever, okay? Uh, in a huge video, by the way. But what I'll do is just um, split it into several videos and answer as many of your questions as I can. But before I go on, you have to seek a mental health professional. You have to seek an OCD specialist. And for a, a more professional um, for more professional answers to your questions, what you should do is, is go on YouTube and seek out a guy called Dr. Patrick McGrath. Um, he's part of the organization No CD. And um, he does Q&A every week. And you should really tune in to him and ask him some questions because he is, you know, he's the business, okay? Anyway, question number one. How long does HOCD last? Well, you know, guys, that depends on you. OCD is made up of compulsions and avoidance. Okay, you, you know, there's more to it than this, but if you eliminate compulsions and avoidance, you basically eliminate OCD for the most part. And whether you have got the courage to give up your compulsions and to give up your avoidance is up to you. Can HOCD go away on its own? It's possible, but you could be waiting until you're 80 years old. You know, there's a chance it can go, it can, it can lessen and go away with time, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't gamble on that. And I would take action straight away. So the answer to how long does HOCD last is it's all up to you and your courage to confront what needs to be confronted. Okay. Okay. If I had an experience as a child with same sex, does that mean anything? Well, I don't want to go down the reassurance route if I can possibly help it. But I would go with no. Just because you had an experience as a child doesn't necessarily mean anything. Now, am I telling you that you're gay or not gay? I'm not telling you anything. Okay, but what I will say is children do experiment. Okay, young adults experiment. It's part of the growing up process. And not only that, some people just screw around. Okay, I had a couple of buddies, um, Chris, Chris and Case, and they used to screw around all the time. But they both, you know, you know, it was just a laugh. It was just a joke. But they both married, both heterosexuals, and both enjoying their lives. So it's part of the growing up process. It's part of maybe maturation. It's part of early development. It doesn't mean anything. You know, and, and we... You know, what I was getting at with Chris and Case is very often we remember things the wrong way. And if you kissed your best friend or something like that, um, it might have been for a goof, for a laugh. It might have been just because you genuinely felt friendship towards that person. But you start remembering it wrong. And you start mentally reviewing and analysing to see if that's evidence that you could actually be gay. So, in conclusion, if I had a, an experience as a child with same sex, does that mean anything? My answer is no. It doesn't necessarily mean anything at all.
okay always an exception of course but for the majority I would say it doesn't mean anything okay the next one will allowing thoughts make you gay <laughs> well that's like somebody with harm or CD you know who may be a mother has um, an intrusive thought about stabbing her child which is very terrifying to her so if she allowed that thought into consciousness would that make her a psychopath do you get where I'm going with this so will allowing thoughts make you gay no if you if you're heterosexual by nature and you're having HOCD thoughts then allowing them in is part of the treatment it's what you need to do you need to allow the thoughts in without responding to them response prevention is everything is everything it's not what happens to you it's what you do about it it's how you react um, you know by quitting all the compulsions uh, all avoidance see when you suppress a thought when you push a thought down that's a form of avoidance because you're avoiding feeling the the distress or the guilt or the shame or the disgust or anything that goes with it so will allowing thoughts make you gay absolutely not it's part of ERP it's part of the treatment and it's what you should be doing because you cannot control in, uh, intrusive thoughts everyone has intrusive thoughts even people without OCD but people without OCD have a different way of responding to them example let's say I had a thought about pushing somebody into the train tracks or pushing somebody in front of a car ah, okay I had the thought I can dismiss it but somebody with harm OCD for example would think of some of pushing somebody into traffic and think huh, what does that mean about me am I bad am I am I this or am I that and you know it's it's their response so with OCD people it's your response that's keeping the whole thing going okay so if you had a thought about being gay you know um, whatever treat it like it's a normal thought do not no matter what it how it makes you feel sit with that until it becomes no more and it will pass on its own okay right it's the next one right do you have what's he say what's he say here do you have an effective elevator speech when it comes to explaining OCD themes to others well I don't know about that but what I can say is is that OCD is OCD no matter what the theme okay it's all about standing up to the doubt it's all about standing up to the uncertainty um, the thing about themes and this is something I've noticed over over you know for some time is people get really engulfed by the by their themes okay you know I'm I joined the scrupulosity OCD site okay and it's absolutely amazing it's amazing because I got a HOCD page on, on Facebook okay I, I look at that and I talk to people and give advice when I can but when you go over to the to the scrupulosity site it's almost like being on the same page just with, with a different theme and th this is the thing about OCD people right instead of googling pure O instead of googling pure obsession OCD 
and studying that for information purposes, not for reassurance, of course, right? People don't do that. They only study, they, they, they really get into their own theme. With HOCD person, it's HOCD, 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 on and on and on and on and on and on. Scrupulous OCD people are the same. Harm OCD people are the same. They, they stick to their themes where if they broaden their horizons a little bit and looked at pure raw, they gain, you know, more of an insight, more of an objective look on things. And um, people get lost in their themes. That's what, I'll, that's what I'll say with that. But you should be looking broader than that. And ultimately, what you need to be doing is changing your behavior. Because OCD doesn't respond to information, to words, to reassurance. It's behavior that changes OCD, okay? Right, next up. Why does it feel so real? Now, I've listened to a lot of uh, Dr. Patrick McGrath. I can't speak highly enough about the guy, okay? And as he says in several of his videos that I've seen, why does it feel so real? It feels so real because it's OCD. Okay? If it wasn't, you know, if it didn't feel real, you wouldn't have a problem. Okay? Why does harm OCD feel so real? Why does scrupulosity OCD feel so real? Okay, and various other forms, ROCD and et cetera, et cetera. Pedophile OCD, why does it all feel so real? Part, part of that is because there's fear involved. There's a lot of fear. Right, let me give you an example of how things can feel so real, okay? Right, cue stupid music, okay? You're at your buddy's house and you are both watching a horror movie on TV. It's very late at night, okay? And you're hiding behind a pillow and the music is going and there's people being butchered and all that crap. And anyway, the, film, the movie ends and your body is still in, in a state of hypervigilance and, and, and fight or flight. And your buddy says to you, okay, go home now because I gotta, I gotta go to bed, I gotta be up in the morning. So you leave your buddy's house. You walk along in the cold air, you know, you could hear the, the trees blowing, you could see your breath in, in the cold of the night. And there's an alleyway between you and your between your buddy's neighborhood and your neighborhood there's an alleyway a spooky alleyway and as you get to the end of the alleyway to walk through it towards the end you see oh my god somebody with a knife somebody's at the end waiting with a knife you can see the shadow and i know it's real because i can feel it i can feel it and your body goes it goes like it feels like it's on fire your heart is pumping in, in his chest you're trembling you really think that there's somebody at the end that's going to kill you because that horror movie is still going around in your head and it all feels very very real and you think to hell with it and you walk through the alleyway anyway you've got to get home you've got to get home and you creep towards the end of the alleyway and guess what it was? It was the shadow of a tree going back and forth. But it felt so real, so real. Your brain was preparing you for, for to either fight or to run. It felt so real. And this is what the brain does. So when you say, why can OCD feel so real? because that's the way the brain operates, okay? So, you know, it's, it's like Dr. McGrath said, 
nobody ever walked into his office and said, hey, my OCD is making me feel so great. You know, what can you do for me to get rid of it? You know, OCD is going to feel real. End of. Okay. Right. Is it normal to have anxiety? No, right, okay, let me read that again. Is it normal to have no anxiety to false attraction? I would go with yes. For most people, they do have anxiety. I mean, this whole thing is very ego dystonic. But I think in the case of some people who've lived with HOCD, for many many years and maybe that's not always the case but for people who have had HOCD for many many years the anxiety have worn off okay it, it's it, almost like they've kind of you know partially habituated to it in a sense but the reason why people get false attractions is because, you know, there's something inside them that's telling them that they shouldn't have it. So what happens? They have it. And just like intrusive thoughts, images, uh, urges, feelings, whatever. If it's intrusive and you try to push it away or deny it, it'll come back. And yes, this can happen for people who, who haven't had a HOCD for very long either, okay? It all depends on the person. And this is what you've got to realize, everyone's different. So I would say, yes, it's absolutely natural in some cases not to have anxiety with, with false attraction, false arousal, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Okay, next. Is there a way to deal with OCD urges, HOCD urges? Yes, there is a way. Because an urge is just the same, in a sense, as an intrusive thought, feeling, or image. It's intrusive. So what you have to do is resist the urge and preferably resist it without ruminating. Stop figuring out why the urge is there. Stop figuring out when it'll go away. Stop figuring out, figuring out, figuring out. Stop it. Okay? Resist the urge just like you would any compulsion. Okay? Okay? <clears throat> Any advice for getting my libido and attraction back for the opposite sex? Well, I, I've actually done videos on this. Um, and I don't have an awful lot of time to stay on one, one question, really. But I would say one of the first things to do is to stop ruminating. Because if you were dwelling on something, pay, uh, you know, directed attention towards it, if you were trying to figure things out, all this will make it all so much worse. Okay? Accept the fact that, you know, you have no libido and no attraction at the moment. Say, say to yourself, I have no libido. Maybe I'll never get it back. I have no attraction. Maybe I'll never get it back. Who knows? Stop trying to force it. You can't force attraction. You can't force libido. Once conscious effort interferes with an unconscious process, you're asking for trouble. Okay, you know, it's, I, I did use an analogy before of a crocodile. If a crocodile is chasing you 
and is is you know obviously going to kill you if it catches you in that moment do you think you could be attracted to somebody in that moment do you think you could get an erection well no because the fight or flight has kicked in and you're trying to escape for your life and i know meron um the one point he uses this analogy and uh shout out to meron you you got a great channel dude and um i often tune in to watch your stuff so i would say give yourself permission not to have sex drive give yourself permission not to have attraction stop ruminating and once you quit mental compulsions once you quit things like mentally reviewing checking um and various various other things there's more of a chance of it coming back okay i am got a lot of time to spend on each question so that's basically the short answer okay right okay does anyone experience thoughts during time of intimacy well yes because when you're being intimate with some someone that's when you're most vulnerable and ocd being the notorious opportunist that it is will seize that opportunity to send you intrusive thoughts you know for example um let's say you get a woman with hocd and she's in the middle of um you know doing uh, the wild thing bumping uglies and all of a sudden she she'll, she'll have a thought about her best friend or about you know um who knows somebody she works with maybe even a family member you know whatever okay somebody of the same sex and that will kill her sex drive same with the guy if a guy's having sex with a woman and he's vulnerable it's what he's passionate about it's it's sex means something to him his partner means something to him you know and ocd always attacks what you love and value an intrusive thought might come into his head while he's pumping away and a thought of his best friend will come into his mind and what happens he loses his, his erection and he gets distracted so yes they can definitely happen in times of intimacy because that is when you're vulnerable okay okay next one how do i know i'm not gay well nobody can have 100% certainty about anything okay only an idiot has 100% certainty about anything only somebody who got a, a thick head a neanderthal an ape man a monkey boy you know your basic mindless worker bee you know somebody who's notoriously stupid are the only people that are 100% certain and it's you you are quest for certainty that's screwing you up in the first place which is why you're doing all these mental compulsions like ruminating and checking etc because you're looking for certainty so how do i know i'm not gay the answer is you don't you know for the most part what i'm saying is okay let me back up there right from the age 0 until you just developed hocd it wasn't probably even something you thought about you know you you were heterosexual or or but or, or gay or whatever your natural orientation is you didn't give it a second thought okay but you know you you were pretty certain you were pretty certain what you were but you weren't 100% certain you know it, it was just something you never thought of 
So, so the answer is you can never fully know. Not really. So don't bother chasing the certainty. Don't bother chasing a hundred percent guarantee because you don't get it. And all the people out there who are busy enjoying their lives, they themselves don't have a hundred percent guarantee. And what's more, they don't even think about it. Let me just tell you this. I can't remember for the life of me who told me this, but years ago I was talking to somebody and he had said to his own dad one day, he used to have these talks with his father. And you, he said to his dad one day, could you ever be with a man? And his father shrugged and he said, maybe, but I've never met a man that I'm attracted to. Now, do you, did you see his attitude? Did you see how flexible he was? Maybe, but I've never met anyone, you know, I'm attracted to. So give up your quest for an answer. This is what rumination is. Rumination is constantly looking for an answer. Constantly looking for an answer. And no answer will ever quench OCD's thirst. Because you give OCD an answer, it's not satisfied with the answer, and it'll come back with more questions. This is why you need to stand up to the uncertainty. It's not about getting certainty on your sexuality. It's about being able to tolerate uncertainty in this one area of your life. Isn't it strange that you can go out into the street and you, know, you don't think about the fact that you could get killed on the road or that you could have a car accident or so many other things that could happen you already live with uncertainty but you don't give those things a second thought but this one area where you're very rigid and black and white this is the area that you can't tolerate uncertainty and what you need to do is bring it into alignment with everything else so so that you can actually live with uncertainty okay Anyway, next one, next one. How do I stop overanalyzing? There's a great guy on YouTube. He's a guy called um, Michael Greenberg, Dr. Michael Greenberg. And he does rumination folk focused ERP. And if there's anybody in America you can contact uh, Dr. Greenberg because he does rumination focused ERP, meaning he sees rumination as the cornerstone of anxiety. And that even before you do any ERP, he teaches you how to stop ruminating. Okay, he's the expert and you wanna look, look that up. I would say in a nutshell, how do I stop overanalyzing? I would say, Rumination is analytical thinking, okay? It's analytical thinking, which means you can stop. But people find it hard to stop because they're afraid. Rumination is a compulsion. Overanalyzing is a compulsion. And A, make a decision to stop. B, what's your excuse for ruminating? What's your justification for ruminating? Is it because you're trying to figure something out? Is it because you're trying to prevent something? Let that sink in. Are you trying to prevent something? What is it you're getting to the bottom of? What is it you're afraid of happening? You know, look at the justification. Look at Michael Greenberg's articles. But on a practical level, I would say to keep busy but to keep busy in a healthy way. Don't suppress anything. Don't, um, how, would I, how would I put this? Right, 
there's been times in my life when I've been very worried about things, right? And I've done a lot of driving work. And I get a call, you need to be at this destination, and you need to be at that destination, and you should be in that destination half an hour ago. Um, you should be in that destination yesterday. Where are you? Come on, come on. And I'm going and going and going and going, and you're chasing time and chasing time and chasing time. And all of a sudden, the worry goes. And even though it's a bit stressful doing the job, my thing that I've been analysing and worrying about and everything goes because I got no time to think about it. So I would say is don't suppress anything. Don't suppress any intrusive thoughts. Or um, I would say to distract yourself healthily in a constructive way. In other words, get on with your life. That's what I'm saying to you. If you keep yourself busy in a healthy way, without suppressing anything, without pushing anything away, without trying to push the anxiety down. Don't do that. Just get on with your life. That helps with um, rumination. At least it did for me, and I would suggest it would for you. You know, if you were going to sit around all the time thinking, if one of your compulsions is to sit around and think, and try and work things out. And I can tell you firsthand, that was one of my compulsions, to sit and think. I did it for years, decades even. That type of self-indulgence will make everything much worse because rumination causes anxiety. Let me repeat that. Rumination causes anxiety. So I would say is in a constructive and a healthy way, keep yourself busy, make a decision I am not going to figure this out. I am not going to analyze and try and get to the bottom of anything because there's nothing to get to the bottom of. There's nothing to analyze. It's a story that my mind is telling me. I am going to ignore that story and get on with my life. That's what I would say. But for more professional answers, of course, look up Dr. Patrick McGrath and No CD and talk to them because I'm a YouTuber, not a therapist, okay? Right, next question. Why does it seem like I enjoy the thoughts sometimes? That's a tricky one. OCD is a massive liar, okay? OCD is a puppet master. It's a trickster. And I've got to be careful here without giving too much reassurance. And I'd rather leave this particular question to the professionals. But OCD does make you think like you enjoy the thoughts. That's part of its trickery. That's part of its makeup. Okay? Sometimes a person with intrusive thoughts won't get the accompanying anxiety and it'll start to feel as if it's you know you, you, you're in you know you could enjoy it or whatever but it's all a lie it's all a lie now let's let's get back to brass tacks am i trying to tell you what orientation you are no i'm just trying to tell you which way ocd works so before anyone starts criticizing me it's not my intention to reassure anyone. I'm just trying to say that OCD is a trickster, which is what it is. Why do I feel like my whole life is a lie? Because when you have an intrusive thoughts, which are ego dystonic, and these intrusive thoughts are very convincing, it's going to make you think like you're living a lie. It's going to give you the imposter syndrome. Answer me this. Any of you out there remember being a kid and you was accused of something by your parents, by your teachers, by something, and they accused you so much that in the end you almost believed it yourself? Well, it's a similar kind of thing. OCD will send you these intrusive thoughts which you don't want or feelings and you are going to feel like 
uh, an imposter. I was, I mean, I, I can remember sometime talking to Billy and Billy was saying he'd be, at the time he didn't have much of a sex drive and he'd be in the company of his buddies and they'd all be talking about women and stuff. And of course he didn't have much of a sex drive at that time. So he started to feel like an imposter, almost like he was a gay man who was just pretending to be heterosexual. Again, OCD is a trickster. So an OCD can make you feel like you were living a lie. Okay? Right, next one. Anyone else do strange stuff as a kid and now OCD is using that against you? Yeah, well, I, I didn't I mention something like this earlier on? Sometimes things can go on in your childhood. Okay, you could experiment or maybe you smack your best friend's butt or there can be a whole number of things. And your OCD will scan and mentally review the past, looking for evidence for or against, you know, the HOCD. It look for evidence in some cases to, you know, to back up the fact that you could be gay or it look for evidence to back up that you could be straight. You know, in one video, I called it rumination you know, reviewing the past or whatever, but it's, it's, you know, mentally reviewing. But to me, it all comes under rumination, you know. I'm not going to be picky that way. But anyway, in conclusion, anyone else do strange stuff as a kid and now OCD is using that against you? Yes, because OCD will use anything it can. Anything. You know, if you turned up at a gunfight with OCD, okay, and you had a pistol, you know, think of the Clint Eastwood music. Do -do 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 -do. You know, you know, know what I mean? And um, you turned up with a gun. Well, OCD would be like the mask. Remember, was, was it the mask where he had a coat on and he opened his coat and he had machine guns and he had everything inside? That's what OCD is like. OCD will use anything against you, anything. You know, kitchen sink job. It'll throw anything at you. Including your past. So, that's that. That's that, my friends. Right. Why don't I feel disgust when looking at other dudes? This is something that happened to um, Maria, and I did a video on Maria, and this happened to many other people. Maria was at a party, and uh, I think it might have been a bit different with her. With Maria, okay, same horse, different jockey, okay? Maria went to a party, and there was a hot guy there, and... All her friends really liked this guy, but for some reason she didn't have any attraction towards him at all. And because she didn't have any attraction, she was freaking out. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And that was the moment she developed HOCD. She thought she should have attraction. See that rigid black and white perfectionist mentality? But the same thing can happen when you actually look at the same um, the same sex. Like you see two guys making out and stuff and you don't feel disgust. And I should, I should feel disgust. I should. And because you don't, then the question comes in. Why don't I? Why don't I? Then the rumination begins. You know, I was driving past um, a place going back about eight, nine, ten months ago. And there was two guys, and one grabbed the other guy and sort of put him up against the wall, and the two of them started kissing. 
I looked at that. I didn't feel disgust. I just thought, oh, you know, two guys kissing. You know, this is, this is the 21st century. I didn't think anything, and I just drove on. You know, I mean, I'm I, not saying I thought it was cool or anything. I mean, it did. I did think, like, well, what the hell are they doing? You know, for crying out loud. But I didn't feel ultimate disgust. But this is black and white perfectionist, all or nothing thinking. I should. I should feel disgust. Well, sometimes we don't. And then we question why we don't and question why we don't. And that's when the whole ball starts rolling, okay? So just because, long story short, just because you didn't feel disgust doesn't mean anything, okay? Okay, this is an interesting one. And um, this is from Brianna. Why can I only orgasm with HOCD thoughts? Now, Brianna, I'm not going to say her last name, but Brianna is a gay woman, okay? And she has intrusive thoughts about being heterosexual, and she doesn't like it because she, she's always identified as lesbian. And... She got to a point where she could only, because she'd lost her sex drive completely and intrusive thoughts, rumination, the usual ingredients for, for OCD. And she, um, basically she can only orgasm when she thinks about her HOCD thoughts. Now, I asked her at one time, are these intrusive thoughts or, these, or is this rumination or is this your thoughts you were making on purpose? And she said, well, it's thoughts I'm making on purpose. So what I can think of from the top of my head is that because you've got no sex drive, and OCD can give you groinal responses and give you false attraction, whatever. I would say because she cannot access her natural sex drive yet, anything is better than nothing. False attraction is better than no attraction. So I think she's compulsively using these She's compulsively using false attraction and false arousal in order to get herself off. That's what I would say. She's, she's using her ruminating thoughts to get herself off because any orgasm is better than no orgasm. That's what I say. I could be wrong about that, and I'm sure... Uh, people like Michael Greenberg and Dr. McGrath, Dr. Phillips and Dr. Grayson, I'm sure, you know, they can answer better than that. I'm sure Chrissy Hodges, Brian OCD Mindful, I'm sure they could give you a better answer, but that's my answer, okay? Right. Okay. I'm allowing the thoughts in and accepting, but they still keep coming back. What am I doing wrong? Well, I think, first of all, judging by what I can read, I think what you're doing wrong, dude, if you can hear me, is that your end goal is to get rid of the thoughts. Okay? And you shouldn't get... That shouldn't be your goal. Okay? Your goal should be to learn to live with the thoughts, not to push them away. Okay? So, let me read that again. I'm allowing the thoughts in and accepting, but they still keep coming back. What can I do wrong? Well, also I take it to mean by what you've um, 
written is that you've either got rid of most of the anxiety from the thoughts, you've habituated to them partially, and maybe, maybe you've got rid of all the anxiety. But they're still popping in, which they do. But it's because there's a part of you that's still ruminating about them and there's a part of you that still has the intention of getting rid of them. Can you imagine uh, going to college and you share a house with somebody or, you know, like um, an apartment? You have a roommate. Can you imagine you didn't like that roommate? In fact, you hated them. But there's nothing you can do. You're sharing a room with them. You've got college or university or whatever it is you're doing. You have to put up with them. And, and so they move in with you and you live with them. And in the end, you know, after maybe, it might take a while, maybe three or four months, maybe you end up getting along with them in the end. But for that initial period, you couldn't stand them. But eventually, you habituated, in a sense, to them. You climatized to them. Well, the thoughts are the same thing. Stop trying to get rid of them. If they come into consciousness, they come into consciousness. Tough. Accept that they're there. And your problems will be over. OCD isn't so much about the intrusive thought. OCD is about your reaction to the intrusive thought. And when I say thought, I mean feelings, images, urges, etc. OCD, as to paraphrase Michael, Michael Greenberg, OCD is compulsion and avoidance. You eliminate compulsion and avoidance and you eliminate OCD. So it's your reaction to the thoughts. If the thoughts... When, when, if you watch a video of mine called Face in the Unknown... I tell you about um, all the nightly compulsions um, I used to do before going to bed because I was having all these intrusive thoughts. I refused to do the compulsions. I got up the next day and I was more or less cured. And I still had intrusive thoughts, but they didn't mean anything to me. And if they come into my head, I just let them, let them come into my head. It did come back eventually. But that because, that's because at the time I wasn't well versed in uh, continuing giving up compulsions. And, um, you know, I didn't know as much about OCD back then. And my mother was very ill, so it eventually came back with me. But um, anyway, that's my answer. Moving on. Moving on. Can people have derealization with HOCD and how, and how do I overcome it? Yeah, well, derealization is a part, it's a, it's a mental health thing, it's a part of OCD and as well as other disorders, I believe. And I may, may be wrong about this, but I think I've had derealization from a young age. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, derealization is when the world around you seems surreal and dreamlike, like there's a pane of glass between you and everyone else. Um, when I was a child, I, I used to get strange, strange feelings. And the world around me used to change. It used to feel like I was living in an alternate timeline or a different dimension. Have you ever gone away from home and you've come back after a long time and everything seems strange? It's like as if you're looking at the place from an outsider's point of view. You know, that's how things used to seem to me back when I was a kid. Sometimes it would last for months. Or another way of putting it is, if you can look around your house, um, you know what your house looks like, right? Can you imagine a, a giant hand picked up your house and moved it to a different country? And even though you'd look around your house and it would look the same, there's something different about it. There's a tilt shift, an angle shift. There's, it seems strange. Well, that's what used to happen to me as a kid and I never really figured it out until recently. When I give up compulsions, I get derealization. The world seems very strange. 
I've suffered with with that huge amount of that feeling where there's a pane of glass between you and everyone else. And when I had a breakdown, I call it a breakdown, but it was a massive anxiety spike whilst working nights. My whole world morphed out of reality. And I lived like that for a long, long time, like living in fog, in cloud. So yes, I think whatever form of OCD you have, I think derealization can be part of the equation. So anyway. Right. How do I stop checking the same sex out? Well, by that question, I would suggest that you check in the same sex out to see if you're attracted to them or not. Or to see if you're not attracted to them. Um, people also do the same thing with the, with the opposite sex or, you know, whatever sex they prefer. They do it that way too, to see if they are attracted, trying to force it. So how do I stop checking the same sex out? Well, checking is a compulsion and the way to beat that is to stop doing the compulsion. When you catch yourself checking, stop. Because when you're checking, what you're doing is running away from uncertainty. Okay? And the goal is, as most of us know, it's not to gain certainty because that's what you're trying to do through doing the compulsion, through checking. You're trying to gain certainty. Stop trying to gain certainty. Learn to live with uncertainty. Maybe I'm gay. Maybe I'm not. I refuse to figure it out. That's a good starting point. Resist the urge. Just the same as intrusive thoughts, images, feelings... Uh, you know, you, you can go through the whole list. The, see, when you change your behavior, you change your brain. Okay? OCD responds to behavior, not to words. So when you change your behavior, you change your brain. So stop checking. Stop doing it. You can do it. It's within your control. Be happy not having an answer. OCD loves answers. But whatever answer you give it, it's never going to satisfy it because it's a bottomless well, which is why you need to tolerate the uncertainty. If you're in a sauna and the sauna is getting very, very hot, what do you do? Run, run out of the sauna? No, you stay in the sauna. You stay in the sauna and you tolerate the heat because you're in that sauna for a reason. Okay. Shall I just stay at home until HOCD passes? And the answer is a definite no. Okay? Because avoidance is a form of compulsion, or can be. And when you avoid something, you are not standing up to it. See, what's the opposite of avoidance? It's exposure. So say you're avoiding going to the gym, going to the shopping mall, going to school, going to work. Because there's somebody you think... Um, you may be attracted to or you're afraid somebody thinks you're gay or, or whatever by avoiding it you're never going to get over it you need to confront it and quit all mental and physical compulsions when you're in the presence of what of what um frightens you see to get over something you stay in the presence of what frightens you okay it's like, I, I like to use the bridge analogy. If you had a phobia of bridges, you could walk to the end of that bridge and think, oh, to hell with that. 
no and you walk back what happens you keep hold of your fear you get to keep your fear or you could think right to hell with it and you run across the bridge as fast as you can get it over and done with and you get to the other end that's more admirable but it's still um it's still avoidance in a sense so you're not fully going to get over it the way to beat that fear is to step onto the bridge sit down and stay there for a couple of hours until your anxiety comes down that's the way to do it so don't avoid anything um if you find yourself in the presence of somebody you're attracted to and the intrusive urges or or whatever come on allow them to be if you get a groinal response don't suppress the groinal response if you feel false attraction allow it to be so do not avoid anything because you will never it's, it's like a bully if if you don't stand up to the bully you're never going to get over your fear of him you can stay at home and wait and wait and wait and wait to feel confident but the truth of the matter is you never go into because the brain listens more to behavior than it does to words this is why reassurance doesn't work because ocd doesn't really you know reassurance can work for two or three minutes or a day or a week but it always wears off it's the, the, this is why they call it the the doubting disease the doubting disorder it's always behavior 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 that changes ocd always you know if i was your trainer and you were my fighter okay I could boost you up as much as I wanted to and put you on the bag and teach you all the moves and whatever. But before you go for your first fight, you're still going to be frightened. No matter how much skill you've got, how much you've trained, how much, you know, nonsense I filled you with, you're still going to be afraid afraid. Because if you're not afraid, there's something wrong with you. And you go in that ring and you take a couple of shots you give a couple of shots and your brain will see that you can survive it it's always behavior and this is what a lot of ocd people don't realize you know that you get cognitive behavioral therapy well it's the b in the in in the cognitive behavioral therapy that does most of the work okay it, it you know that's more relevant to what we're talking about it's behavior so should I stay at home until OCD passes? You could be 80 years old before HOCD passes, if it ever do. So I would say don't avoid anything. Don't avoid the shopping mall. Don't avoid school. Put yourself into, into the situation that frightens you and don't ritualize. If you feel discomfort, tough. That's part of the treatment. Feel discomfort, you can handle it. It's only discomfort right okay is this the last question i don't know if it is should i abstain from porn should i abstain from porn hmm well do you know i don't think i've really ever addressed this before but I can, remember, I can remember watching porn when I was about 14, right? And I can remember the movie as well. It was called Tangerine Goes to Hollywood. It was like a, a corny 70s thing. And then I watched other things after. And it always, porn can make you feel inadequate. Because you get all these guys with 10-inch penises and... Um, and the women are screaming you know it's all acting of course but it can make you feel um inadequate and it can you know with all over exposure it can desensitize you i think a little bit if i'm honest um until you find more and more kinky things 
but that's on one level on a different level i think people say Sh- should i watch porn because of my hocd uh, you know it all depends on your intention your intention if your intention is to uh, check to see what you are if it's a compulsion don't do it okay if it's a compulsion or an avoidance behavior not to watch porn then watch it sometimes i would say go do the opposite of whatever your uh ocd wants you to do okay and you know to use an analogy right you you could punch one guy in the face okay why did you punch him in the face because he he hit your mother or he did something bad to your mother so you punched the guy in the face okay then uh, you know another another time another example there's a guy you didn't like and for no apparent reason you just went up to him and you went bang and smacked him for no reason both actions are punching in the face but what separates them is the intention you punch the guy in the face for hurting your mother you don't get a day in jail you punch that guy for no reason that other guy you'll do time for it both actions are punching but what separates them is the intention same thing with porn if it's a compulsion to watch porn stop if it's a compulsion of avoidance not to watch porn then occasionally watch it basically do whatever do the opposite of whatever ocd does is no like take on the child's mentality for a second you tell a child not to touch something what did the child do touch it right you leave that ornament where it is what does the child do goes and touches the ornament so basically be a rebel be a rebel and do everything the opposite of what ocd wants you to do so i don't think porn is particularly bad um i know billy and my knowledge was a lot limited back then but billy masturbated to his intrusive thoughts you know and you know this isn't porn but this is brain porn you know he started um he was having intrusive thoughts about guys and he masturbated to it now am i suggesting that you do this no but it was his exposure that worked for him because he was having hocd cd dreams gay dreams you know gay and in inverted commas but the reason why he was having those dreams is because he was ruminating about his condition all the time and when you're ruminating and ruminating and ruminating and ruminating trying to figure out trying to figure out all day every day you're gonna dream about stuff and that's what was happening to him so when he used a bit of mind porn- pornography and started visualizing dudes and and jacked off that was the beginning of his journey to get over hocd am i suggesting that for you no because everyone is different everyone's different and you know the problem with ocd people is they take everything i say literally instead of using a bit of common sense they say oh i'll do that then i'll take out my dick out and i'll jerk off the gay porn that's not always the case it could be bad for you it was just good for him everyone's different so i think i've come to the end of um questions and answers for now i hope that um i've done my best i'll come back with another video with more questions and answers and um thanks for watching guys i really appreciate you tuning in and um adios and i'll see you soon okay Bye for now.
Thank you.